us and give to others what you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning's reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning to read from verse 32 to 36. The believers share their possession. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you ever so much. Wonderful. What I'd like us to do, I know we've had a bit of audience participation already. Um, a little saying has been going around my head. You may have heard it. It's not the bits in the Bible I don't understand which disturb me. It's the bits in the Bible I do understand which disturb me. I'm going to bring up a passage of scripture as a warm-up exercise. Uh, don't blame me for the reading uh, we've got today, Acts 4. It's actually incredibly challenging. Jack chose it, uh, or, or the liturgical commission chose it. So I'm the messenger. Take it up with Jack. Take it up with the Lord. But it's a warm-up exercise. We bring up a passage of scripture from Philippians. This is directed at a, a smaller church than the passage that we've got today, a local church. If we could bring up on the screen, please. I'd like you to turn to your neighbours in front and behind, and as you read through this passage here, I'm going to give you about 90 seconds to do it. I want you to highlight what are the three most disturbing or challenging words in this passage, and I want you to rank them one, two, and three. Okay, so there's your instructions. You've got 90 seconds to do it. People in front and behind, find a neighbour to discuss it. There we go. The three most challenging words in this passage. And here's some great discussions going on. I'll give you another 30 seconds to rank the three most challenging words in this passage. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to pick on some people. So... We've got some groups I can see around the room. So the third most challenging word in this passage, if, if I ask this group here, what, what did you go for? What's the third most challenging? Huh? Sharing. Another? Third most challenging? Don't be shy. Okay, second most challenging word in the passage. How about this side? Ah, one. Nothing. Nothing. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to reveal the sort of Rob Fowler view of the world here. Um, so I believe the third most challenging word in this passage is nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, putting yourself first, or vain conceit, making yourself look good. I really struggle with that. But do nothing. Not some of your activities, but have others that make you look good or, or serve your own agenda. But do nothing. It's not the bits of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me. It's the bits I do understand. That's plain as day, isn't it? We need to think through the implications. Do nothing. Second, I think, is above. Value others above yourselves. Not even on a level. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. Not how am I doing, but how are they doing? How are my brothers and sisters? What's their need? What can I be praying for? How can those needs be met? Value others above yourselves. I mean, come on, can we really think through the practical implications of God's revealed word? So what's number one? Well, he's not speaking to the spiritual elite in the room. He's not speaking to the pastor. He's not speaking to those who so clearly devoted their lives and poured it out on the mission field in the, the most dangerous settings. The most challenging word is any. I'm going to take a survey here. Have any of you had any encouragement in the Lord? Can you stick up your hands and keep them up, please? There we go. Don't be shy. Have you had any comfort from his love? Keep up your hands and hold them high. Any common sharing in the Holy Spirit? Have you experienced that peace, that presence of God in your life? You have. Keep it up. Keep it up. Any tenderness and compassion. So who in this room is qualified to be instructed by this passage? Look at the, look at the hands up in this room. So nothing is a challenging word. Above is a really challenging word. The most challenging is the qualifying word, which means that it applies to all of us. Guys, that's the warm-up act. That's Philippians 2, and we could just say, well, he's talking to a small little church and knew each other, loved each other. Okay, we need to learn about Macedonia, but I'll give you that for now. Let's look at Acts 4. If we bring up the next passage, please. This is our passage for today. And I've highlighted here some words. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. Look at the word any in there. Can we think about the practical implications of this teaching? I think sometimes we look at the early church with this this doe-eyed, like, wow, it would have been so fun to be part of that church. But actually, the challenge to be part of this early church is that no one claimed that any of their, not, not some, any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything that they had. So because this is such a challenging passage and the implications are so enormous, I think we need to check our workings before we launch into this, because otherwise it would be reckless and dangerous. First question we can ask this passage is, does it actually apply today? Or does this actually apply when the church was just small and they all knew each other? The beginning of the chapter, you read it last week, actually explains that the church was not so small by this point. 5,000 men. We know from other places in Scripture, like the following of the 5,000, we know from church history that 5,000 men roughly equated to about 16,500 people. So we're looking at the spirit-filled people in the greater Manchester area, perhaps. We also know that the Lord was adding to their number daily. Two chapters forward in Acts chapter 6... Not only are they not a small church, a growing church, they're also a mixed church. They didn't all get on. We had the Hellenistic Jews with the Greek background. They had the traditional Hebraic Jews. And some of them were missing out, particularly the widows, on the distribution of food. Did the apostles say, no, look, we've crossed a line here where we've become such a big church that that ideal was lovely, but from now on we're really going to focus on the ministry of the word. And hopefully that 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 other stuff will fall into place. No, they said, despite the fact that we're growing in size, we will focus on the ministry of the word, but we will devote spirit-filled people to the daily distribution of food. Okay, so we can't get away from the fact that it wasn't just a small church. It wasn't wasn't simply that it it wasn't a mixed church. We also know that as the church spread around the Mediterranean world, Paul, for example, wrote to a church in Corinth about a church in Macedonia concerning the church in Jerusalem. And he said these words, 
Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality among all the churches. At the present time, as I see it, Paul says, your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, some point in the future, I'm sure, their plenty will supply your need. The goal is equality. It's written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. So not only is the church now much bigger, and it's all the way around the known Mediterranean world, he then quotes a verse of scripture, which is from where? Any, any ideas? Exodus, the church that have come out of Egypt in the wilderness, and we're looking at between tens and hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps even a million. Okay, so it does apply to the global church. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything that they had. Second question we might ask then, it does apply today, does it apply to me? What is the qualifying statement in this passage? Previously, it was the word any. In this one, you might just say, well, no one. So there were no exceptions to this rule. But who was everyone in the church? Well, they were the people who testified to the resurrection of Jesus. So we've all been singing, confessing in the collect, great words in there. We've just been singing about the risen Lord. Would we then qualify as people that believe that Jesus rose from the dead? The only other qualifying criterion here is do you have anything? So Paul, when he spoke to the church in Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, if this life is all there is, Okay, we die and that's it. Eat, drink and be merry. Spend your money on what you want because tomorrow you may die. He also said in the same chapter, but if this life is all there is, then I am the biggest fool. In other words, he said, my radical generosity and sacrifices only make sense if A, there is life beyond this world and B, that life will only be entered and joined and governed by those who live differently from this world. It's not the bits of the Bible I don't understand that disturb me. It's these bits that are plain, and we need to think through their implications. So do you have anything? This is where it gets really tough. Again, I didn't choose this passage for today, so blame Jack. Did you consult with the rest of this church, and I'll let you off the hook with the global church at the moment, about which car you would buy? Did you consult with the rest of the church about what house you would live in? Did you consult with the rest of the church, I'll let you off the hook with the global church and myself, about which holidays you would have this year and where you would go? Because you've been spending someone else's money or holding on to someone else's money. I'm as guilty of this as anybody in this room. We're sitting under the word of God, which either means what it says or it doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a collection Okay, so if everybody could get out their payment method. So the nearest payment method to them, get it out, come on. Your nearest one, so if you've got a handbag, get out your your contactless. If you've got a contactless on your phone, you can get that out. If everyone just hold up their payment method, just for a minute. I'm going to come around in a minute and take a collection for the global church, because it's not our money. (laughs) It's not our money. So if everybody could hold it up. Here we go, I've got an app on here that will zap and take your phone. Now, just before I come around and take the money, what I'd like you to do... I'd like you to get your wallet and hand it to the gentleman in front of you. And he's going to decide how much you're going to give. So have you got your phone there? Can you pass your phone to the gentleman behind you? He's going to decide how much you're going to give. I'm not going to do that. But is that not the actual practical application of what this passage is saying? How much more generous do you feel with someone else's money? Well, you're always spending someone else's money. You're always holding on to someone else's money. And that money belongs to the global church. Through compassion, I got to meet Tossi. He was brought up in Kenya's Mathura slum. Uh, Life is so hard that his father left. Uh, no food. They go two days at a time without any food. So his friends used to go out with him and rob food from people who look wealthier. Uh, apart from him and his brother, all of his friends were shot and killed. 
He was reached by his local church that had partnered with Compassion. He was sponsored by the Johnsons in America, who paid at that time 20 pounds a month and prayed and wrote letters to him. And through his local church, he came to faith in Jesus. He got food, health, education, recreation, vocational training, eventually went on to university to study hospitality. His first salary came in, and it wasn't enough to live off. Do you know what he did? 70% of that first salary, he signed up to sponsor a child back in Kenya. In Togo, there was a huge problem with poverty at the moment, food security particularly. So this is about the amount of flour that some families per person, so we're looking at between one and two kilos of grain per person per month, which will make about this much flour. This is in some areas, not in all areas, but there's a huge food security problem for three reasons. Environmental reasons, the climate crisis. Sometimes it doesn't rain for three years, and then when it does, it just wipes everything out. We also have an economic problem because of the wars, so the price of grain has gone up. And we also have educational problems, big educational problems, because superstitiously or economically, they think that the trees are just taking the moisture that they need out of the ground for their crops, so they're just chopping down the trees, which is no better than a short-term solution. Now, in this area of Togo, there's a local church which have partnered with Compassion, and the pastor reached out to some of the families that look poorest in the community. That's why we go through the local church, because they know the people who are in most dire straits. And they approached one family with the offer for their child of the Compassion Program, food, health, education, recreation, vocation, and discipleship through their local church. And this is what they said. Thank you so much, but we can't say yes right now. We've seen neighbors far worse off than us. At least we have each other, and we already know the Lord. Once you've asked everyone else in the village, please come back and ask again. So it is possible. I'm going to go through a little story in the Bible which actually illustrates something, an amazing story in real life. You might know about Elijah and the widow. If you don't know the story from the Old Testament, Jesus referred to it when he read out his manifesto in Luke 4. I've got good news for the poor. And then straight after that, he said there were many widows in Elijah's time, but the Lord sent him to just one in the region of Sidon. So this, this widow was, was desperate. She was from a dodgy rogue nation, which is where the, the, the Jezebel spirit had come from, and the Jezebel queen. I mean, it was just a, a difficult, unjust time. And Elijah meets this widow because the Lord told Elijah that the widow's going to provide for him in the middle of a drought. Go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. I've directed a widow to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he got to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, can you bring me a little water in a jar so I can have a drink? As she was going, I mean, that's really kind, he called and said, oh, can I have a piece of bread too? As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering these few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die, a last meal. Elijah said, well, don't be afraid. Go and do what you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour won't be used up. The jug of oil won't run dry until the Lord sends rain again on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah told her. And there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. The jar of flour wasn't used up. The jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord. Like the families that Compassion aims to reach through local churches, this widow is very nearly out. And I don't know what it's like to have one jar of flour left for the foreseeable future for you and your kids. Just halving it, halving it, halving it, not totally emptying it each time, just kidding yourself that as long as there's a little bit left, I'm not totally out. Totally desperate situation. And not only is she out of resources, she's also a bit out of faith, isn't she? You might notice in that reading, she said in verse 12, as long as the Lord your God lives, Elijah, I've only a few bits left in the cupboard and then we're done for. So it's not that she denies the existence of God, but she has no experience of the Lord personally in her life. And looking at her poverty, she just assumes that the, the Lord's got no interest in changing that situation anytime soon. It's the Lord your God, Elijah, who looks after you, but certainly doesn't look after me. And then Elijah arrives on the scene, and some hero he turns out to be. He says, listen, love, I've walked a long way. 
So bake me some bread first and then use what's left on yourself. But as the story unfolds, we see actually it's not exploitation at all. It's an invitation. How so? Because Elijah is not taking away her last chance at life. He's giving her the chance of a brand new kind of life. There was the old life. It was just a slow death when everything rested on her and the natural resources in her store. And that is as true for this widow with 100 grams of flour as it is for anyone in this room with 100 grand in their bank account. But she is invited into a supernatural life where she gets to hear the word of the Lord herself. She gets to trust the Lord herself. She gets to see then the Lord turn up in her life. And best of all, get used by the Lord herself to the benefit of someone else, even her. You see, poverty is economic, physical, and educational, but ultimately, it's spiritual. And fundamentally, it's relational and aspirational, which is why so many Compassion graduates will say that the most precious thing their local church and the Compassion program gave them wasn't actually food, health, and schooling, but the opportunity to know Jesus, to be connected to his church, and to discover their personally God-given purpose in serving his world. I'm going to show you a short video, and afterwards I'm going to explain the punchline of it, which illustrates this passage so perfectly. This is Richmond's story. My name is Richmond Wondera. I come from a country called Uganda. My mother was a very loving mother. My father was a very hard worker. But unfortunately, when he was murdered, everything changed for us dramatically. We ended up in a slum called Naguru, which is Uganda's worst slum. Naguru was dubbed the forgotten community. And life on the street was extremely difficult. The things I did to survive. Poverty robs children of the dignity of choice. I would have chosen school, I would have chosen food, I would have chosen health. When this Compassion staff member came to our home and told my mom that Richmond has got a sponsor, uh, the amount of dancing that filled our home was beyond description. My sponsor began to write to me and I just, I felt known, I felt connected. They basically helped me become a child again. My pastor invited me to be part of the pastoral leadership and I established the Pastors Discipleship Network. And so the Pastors Discipleship Network exists to train and equip African pastors. Right now we celebrate God for 6,000 churches that have sent their pastors to be a part of our program. So what started as one decision to sponsor one young African boy? has ended up not just changing the boys' family, but the boys' church and the boys' community. It's the best possible investment a person could ever make. The children that we see today will be around long after we are gone. And to invest in them, I can't think of any better investment. And so anyone who is thinking about sponsoring a child, do it. Do that. Because you're investing in tomorrow. poverty himself, Richmond has gone on to serve the global church. 15,000 pastors have now been released across East Africa. One of the churches that he personally pastors is planting three further churches a year. 1,046 people came to faith in a fortnight last month in one of those churches. He's now building a university called Cornerstone University on a site that Colonel Gaddafi had bought to be committed to Muslim worship. The Muslims have sold it back to Richmond because they can see the progress that he's making. He's also a trustee of Compassion International. But here's the punchline of the story. Because we know who chose to sponsor Richmond all those years ago. And it wasn't a rich man. It wasn't a career woman with money to burn. It was a 15-year-old girl in England called Heather who got a babysitting job so that Richmond could go to school and be connected with his local church. Isn't that so, Jesus? Jesus. I love the G7, I love the G8, I love that geopolitical things happen to tackle this thing called poverty where 365 million children are in extreme situations. 
But I love that the Lord would get an eight-year-old boy, a 15-year-old girl, link them up through their local churches globally, and then release 15,000 pastors into five countries across the eastern continent of Africa. So actually, what I, I, I pray doesn't come through for anything that I'm saying, even though it's such a challenging passage that we've had today, this isn't about guilt. Because this isn't about winners and losers. In the kingdom of God, it's about grace. This is something that we get to do because the most unlikely thing has happened. Jesus has risen from the dead. And this world is not all that there is. So the ministry of compassion is threefold. Christ-centered, church-based, and child-focused. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. So out of a supernatural encounter with the risen Lord who shepherds your life and every need today and into forever, I'm asking you if you would consider sponsoring a child. There are many wonderful ways to serve God's kingdom. So I'm not here to push a particular agenda. It's just something I've seen firsthand in Ethiopia, for example. I know it works. I know the testimonies. And I believe in the Christ-centered, church-based, child-focused nature of it. I believe that is very close to the heart of the Lord. If you'd like to sponsor a child, and actually I hear many people in this church already do. So if that's the case, I have a little... Um, table at the back. Let me know your name and postcode. Then I can link those sponsorships to Christchurch Pennington. And then in the future, we can celebrate the collective impact we're having together. That's one thing you could do. Secondly, please pray for us as a ministry. We support 2.3 million children at the moment through 9,000 frontline churches in 29 of the world's poorest countries. But there are 365 million children. We're not the only ones doing this work, but there's a huge number of children to reach. But the most important thing is that we're not overwhelmed by the big picture, but we're given a starting point. It's a starfish story, isn't it? We, we can't get them all back in the sea before they dry up, but the boy just picks up one, chucks it in the sea, and says, but well, I made a difference to that one. And we get the opportunity to sponsor a child. You can sponsor a young child, like Jack has done, and, and invested in them from probably um, five years old or something, from three years old up to 16. You can sponsor a child who's already 16, 17 years old, and then we pour love and vocational support and the gospel into them for three years before they go out into adulthood. They've only just been reached by their local church. It costs £32 a month to sponsor a child. We write letters to them directly. You are their only sponsor. We pray for them, but they're already connected with their local church, so don't worry about whether or not you're, you're picking them off the streets or leaving them there. These are children that have already been reached. We just need to secure the financial support that they receive through their local church for the future. If you can give us your details today and you'd like to do that, that would be wonderful. If you feel called to other things, wonderful. Everyone wins in the kingdom of God. But I think the challenge from this passage today is this. We can't do nothing. None of them claim that any of their possessions were their own, but shared everything they had.